In this video, I'm going to be looking at Blue Iris, security camera software for both personal use and business use alike. If you look past its 1990s look, then it's got a lot of functionality, and that's what we're going to look at in this video. We're going to go through the installation process, the basic setup, the settings, we're going to look at adding your first camera, and then we're going to look at 24 hour recording, and then we're going to take a look at the web UI, how you can manage and look at your footage, and then we're going to look at setting up motion detection and then finally alerts and notifications. So the first thing we should talk about is the cost. This software isn't free, but it's also not expensive in my opinion. So for a full license, it's $80 or around 85 British pounds. And that allows you to have up to 64 cameras, I think it is. There's also a license where you can pay $40 for one camera, but I don't think that's really worth it. You might as well go for the full one. So for that, that you get the full version and you get support for one year. If you want support or upgrades of future versions for more than a year, then you need to pay an additional license each year. But I have I haven't done that for a few years and I probably only plan to do it every few years. There is also a mobile app for Android and iOS. The Android version is around nine British pounds and the iOS version is 10 pounds. But once you see the UI later, the web UI, then you probably think that you won't really need the app. So the installation is really straightforward. You need to go to blueirissoftware.com and then they make it really easy by having big purchase button and a big download button to download the software. One thing to note is this is Windows only software, so you can't unfortunately run it on Linux or Mac or anything like that. So you are going to need a machine that you're happy to run Windows on, and you're also going to want it running 24 seven so that it's recording your footage. I would recommend installing this on something like an Intel NUC or a spare PC. The reason for that is, is that then you can use the integrated hardware acceleration of either the Intel processor or a dedicated GPU, because then it will make the footage a lot easier to process and not put all the strain on the CPU. I currently do actually run it in a VM and it uses the CPU, but it definitely makes the Intel NUC struggle a little. So once you've installed the software, I recommend giving it a go on the 14 day trial before purchasing it and see if it's for you. In this video, we're not going to look at AI detection, like person detection or anything like that. That could probably be a video in itself, but I might do that at a later date. Click the demo button or enter your license key to go into Blue Iris. And then when we're in Blue Iris, we're going to go to the cog so that we can go to the settings page. There's lots of different tabs in here. We're going to explore a few of them that have got the important settings. If it comes up with a pop-up about installing Code Project AI, then skip that for now because we're not going to do person detection in this video. But if you want to explore it yourself, then feel free to install it. So on the About tab, we want to fill in our system name and then we want to look at a couple of the other settings. So one important one is the export settings. So I recommend setting that so that you can export all your settings and you don't lose them if you have a system outage. So you can just restore those settings and then everything goes back to normal. You'll see in here that there's also an activate button. So if you haven't bought a license yet and you just demo and get, then that's what you press when you've bought your license. This is also where you can see your software updates. So you can either set it to update automatically or manually update. I usually recommend updating things manually, but it's completely up to you. So the storage tab is one of the most important tabs. This is where you determine where you want your footage to be saved to. It also determines whether you do backups to an FTP server. Firstly, you want to ensure that your database is backing up to a location that you're happy with. It needs to be a fast local drive. Also with the new folder, this is where your footage is generally going to go to as it's recording from the cameras. So you also want that to be a fairly fast drive. Just consider how many cameras you've got and how fast your drive needs to be. If you've got something like an NVMe drive, then it's going to be plenty fast enough. If you've got an enterprise hard disk, then it's probably also going to be plenty fast enough. For the size and the limit, it's kind of up to you how you want to set this up. What I do is I set this as one day and then enough space for that one day. And then if you look further down, you can see that after the one day, it will copy it to another folder called storage. And then under the storage folder, you can set the same settings again. So you can set the size and the limit. This is where I have the limit for 21 days because I want to store 21 days of footage. To some extent, this is personal preference, but also it depends on your local regulations like GDPR rules. It might be a good idea to set a limit so you can prove you're being diligent and deleting footage after a certain duration, particularly if you're recording against public roads. 
You can also set Q for backup here, which then backs up some of your footage to FTP. This might depend on your internet connection a bit if you're setting up an FTP server off site. But if you're doing it locally, then it probably doesn't matter. If you're doing it locally, then obviously you want to do it on a different machine to the machine that your Blue Iris is running on. The Users tab is where you're going to want to set up all the users that want to access the Blue Iris interface. So whether that's the web UI or the apps on your phone. This is what you also set up for API users. So if you've got some external systems accessing Blue Iris, then you're going to want to create some users here. There's various settings like LAN only so that users can only access Blue Iris from the internal LAN. And then you can also set up some external access as well if you need to. I have a user in here which is used to access the Blue Iris API. I've got Node-RED which changes user profiles every time I leave the house and come home again. We'll get onto profiles a bit later on. So the web server tab is where you can determine what sort of access you want to give for external systems or just inside your LAN. So you can define internal IP addresses versus external IP addresses. You can determine remote access. There's a remote access wizard, which I'd recommend going through if you do want to give access externally to Blue Iris. Personally, I don't allow any external access to Blue Iris. What I do is I have Home Assistant talking to Blue Iris so that I can see the cameras in Home Assistant. And then everything else is through a VPN if I really need to go into the Blue Iris app and look at some old footage. If you click the advanced button, then you can also define things like IP restrictions, which I'd say is probably worth looking at if you are going to expose your Blue Iris instance to the internet. On the startup tab, the only thing you're really interested in is the checkbox for running as a service. This is so that if your Blue Iris instance was to go down and re or restart, then at least Blue Iris will come back to life on its own without being logged into Windows. So I would say definitely check that box. Now we're going to skip over a couple of the other tabs, but you can have a look at the settings if you want. So we're not going to look at the other tab. We're not really going to look at profiles and schedules in this video, but profiles are very powerful. So a combination of profiles and schedules means that you can actually switch between different modes so that you can record at different times of the day. So you might have some cameras say that you only want to record at night or some cameras that you only want to record in the daytime. So definitely have a look at those settings if you're interested in that. I trigger all mine through automations externally from Home Assistant, so it's a little bit different. So for the camera in the lounge, it only records if we're not home, for example. And what I do there is, is I use Home Assistant, like I mentioned earlier, to change between different profiles. We're also not going to look at the AI tab in this video because that's for things like person detection and number plate recognition. And they're a bit more complicated to set up. In particular, number plate recognition is a lot more tricky than you think. The main setting you're interested in in the cameras tab is the hardware accelerated decode. And this is so that you can offload some of the hard work when re-encoding things onto the GPU instead of using the CPU. You can also change the behavior of double click here if you want. I personally like double clicking in and then it expands the view of the camera to full screen, but it's up to you, it can do a couple of other things instead. And the email service tab can be useful if you want to send notifications or alerts using emails. In here, you'll put in your SMTP settings for your email server and then Blue Iris can do alerts to an email address. So if you want to do some backups to some FTP servers, then this is where you want to put the settings. So you can configure FTP servers here. It doesn't support SFTP, unfortunately. It does support FTP or FTPS. So have a look at that. It also supports passive mode. So if you've got some firewall issues, then you might want to tick or untick that depending on your situation. Now I have to confess that the mobile devices tab is not too useful for me because I don't allow any external access to Blue Iris. But if you're comfortable with that and you want the benefits of using the mobile app, then feel free to do so. There are some powerful things. You can do geofencing, for example, to change profiles for when you're home or not home. If you look in the bottom right, you can see that there's also an Amazon Echo integration. This is in beta at the moment. I haven't tried it myself because I use Google Home devices instead, but it's worth a try if you've got an Amazon device. So we've now explored most of the settings that I think are important, but there's probably some settings in there that are important to you. So have a look through the tabs and the different settings and see what ones that might be of interest. Now let's set our first camera up in Blue Iris. Once you set one camera up, you can use that as a template to create more cameras, which I think is a simple but really useful feature, especially if you've got lots of cameras that are the same make and model. So the first thing we want to do is right click and then it will come up with a new box to add a new camera. Give it a name and also a short name, which you use for API calls and things like that. 
and then you want to make sure you tick disk to disk recording so that it doesn't use as much CPU. You now want to add the configuration to connect to the camera so add the IP address here and then select the make and model of the camera because that will help it determine which ports it needs for things like OnViv. So you can see at the moment it shows 8999 but as soon as I select Rio Link here then you'll see that it's changed to 8000. We can now select the mainstream and the substream and also the type of stream. So here I'm going to do H264, select the substream and the mainstream and that's the URL that it will use to connect to the camera for those two streams. We now need to add the username and password which you would set up within the camera itself. For real leak cameras you might sometimes want to uncheck the send RTSP keeper lives because it can cause issues. I found with this camera you need to keep it checked really. You also want to tick the box on with trigger events. So on this video tab here you can see there's quite a few options. You want to tick limit decoding unless required so that that uses less CPU otherwise it will re-encode all of the video streams. And then on the right here you've got the hardware decode so you can select the type of decoding and also the GPU. So now that we've done that, we need to wait for it to load the camera stream. And there we go. We can see our first camera in Blue Iris. When you double click into it and make it full screen, you can see that it changes the resolution to a better resolution. We are now going to go back into camera settings by right clicking and then we can go through some more details. So you can see here that there's groups that you can add for cameras. So if you look in the top right then that's where you actually can add a camera to groups and then select to view just those cameras. You can add notes in here if you want. Now let's go to the video tab. Now under the video tab you can see that there's an overlay section that allows you to add a date time or images or other text to your actual camera stream when it records it and saves it in Blue Iris. There seems to be a bit of a strange defect in this version that you can't actually delete the date time. I don't know what's wrong with it. So you can untick overlays if you don't need them and you want to save a bit of processing power. I, don't, I find that they don't use much processing power so I keep them enabled but if you are a bit constrained then it might be worth doing that. We also want to change the maximum frame rate to around about what the frame rate of the camera is or just above. So in this instance the 15 or 20 would be fine because cameras aren't normally a higher frame rate than that. I'm going to click OK again and you can see every time you change settings it does reload the camera so you will lose recording of the footage for a little while and there we go. So when it comes to recording I recommend doing 24-7 recording. Part of it is because storage is not as expensive as it used to be but also it's more about if you've got an issue, if you have an incident, then you want to be sure that you've got the footage. If you're using motion detection or person detection, then it's great for finding activity. But if for whatever reason it hasn't triggered and it hasn't caught that incident, then you're in trouble. So I would say set up 24 seven recording. What some people do is they set up motion detection to record the substream, which is of lower quality. And then when it detects motion, it records in full quality. It's up to you. I personally do 24 seven for full quality because it only uses up a couple of terabytes of data for 20 days worth of footage on about five or six cameras. So for me, I think that's worth it. All right, so now looking at the camera settings in Blue Iris itself, we're on the record tab and we can see here that we've got video and this is when it records. So at the moment it's set to when triggered and we're going to change that to continuous. So being on continuous means that it records 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And at the moment it's storing it in the new folder, which is where we want it to store it. So it will store it there for one day and then it will get moved to the stored folder after that day. And then it will stay there for 21 days or however many days you set it at and then it will get deleted. You can see there's various other options here to record continuously plus when motion is detected or just when motion is detected. Below the video settings you can see that you can also get it to save JPEG images and you can get it to save them periodically to so say every minute or every few seconds and then you can also choose the folder where they go. So you can select a different folder to record some snapshots and you can also set the quality and the size of the image to save space. 
So the options below you are going to want to look at. So pre-trigger record time is an important one. So that basically means that if you are just recording based on motion, then you want it to record so many seconds before that so that you've got any events that it might have missed before the motion was detected. Given that we're recording continuously, this is not really relevant for us. Below that, you can choose whether to slice up the video into different sections so that each file is smaller or bigger. And then below that, you can choose whether the JPEGs go onto the timeline or not. You've also got a setting here where you can queue for new clips to be backed up automatically. And the final option is so that you can get it to record the mainstream and the substream or just one of the streams. If we go into these video settings here, you can see you can choose the file format that it actually saves the video in. You can choose the Blue Iris format, which I've got it set to, or a few of the common ones. I recommend leaving it as the Blue Iris format because this allows you to read and write at the same time, which means you can review footage as it's still recording to that file. The downside is though, is that if you do need to export some of the footage, say an incident does occur and you need to give it to someone, then you do have to re-encode the footage so that someone else can actually see it. So that is a bit of a pain. So it's up to you. You might want to choose to record it in MP4 instead. Now, if we look down here at the video compression settings, you can see this is quite important. Direct to disk, I highly recommend because it doesn't use a lot of the resources of the computer. The re-encode settings means that it'll actually re-encode all of the data to a different format as it's coming in. And if you've got multiple cameras, that's really going to kill your processing power. So I'd really recommend keeping it on direct to disk. When it comes to motion detection, there's a lot of options in Blue Iris. So you can set up OnViv, and then with OnViv, you can actually get your camera to notify you when motion has been detected, and then Blue Iris will pick that up and trigger a motion event. Or you can do motion detection in Blue Iris itself. You can do object detection, and you can specify how big or small an object is until it detects that it's motion. You can also do zone crossing. So if you're moving from one part of the picture to the other, then it will detect it as motion, otherwise it won't or you can just do entering and exiting certain zones. The possibilities here are almost endless. Now let's dive into motion detection in Blue Iris in a bit more detail. You want to be on the trigger tab, and then you can see here under sources, there's motion sensor. So we're going to press configure here, and then you can see there's various settings. So the top bit shows you sensitivity around object size and contrast change in the scenery. So you can see as you adjust these, it'll adjust the boxes on the image itself. So the make time is fairly important. This is the amount of time that it detects motion for before it actually triggers it as a motion event. So I tend to set this quite low if I'm doing motion detection so that I capture more things than I need to, but it depends if you're doing alerts and notifications or not, because if you're basing them off this, then you might get a lot of false alerts. The highlight setting here is quite interesting. So you can actually set it so that it shows the objects in rectangles where it thought that the motion occurred on the footage. Now looking at the advanced section, as the name suggests, this is where you can do a bit more complex motion detection. So if we click edit under object detection, then you can see there are more settings. So object travels so many pixels on the stream before it actually detects motion is one of the options or objects crosses zones. So we'll look at zones in a minute, but basically if you type in here A, then that means that if something enters or exits zone A on your footage, then it would trigger. Or if you do something like A, B, like this, then it means that if something goes from zone A to zone B, then it will trigger as motion. You've also got a tick box here so that it doesn't need to cross these zones to re-trigger if it's still detecting the motion. This might be useful if something enters a zone and then moves around in it for quite a while. Otherwise, you might lose some of the motion footage. If you're doing 24-7 recording, then again, a lot of this might be irrelevant because you could just search through more of the footage. But if you're just recording motion events, then this is going to be quite important. The setting here I like, this was clearly added because of a lot of false positives. So basically, if more than this percentage of the image actually changes, then it means that it won't trigger it as a motion event. That's because, as it indicates here, it might be that the sun has just gone in or just come out or something like that, and so the footage changes dramatically, but there's not actually any motion. So the next option down is where you define your zone. So if we tick this and then press edit, it will come up with a window where you can actually select parts of your picture. You can see there's a grid here, and then you can actually draw on there and then if you look on the top left, you can see this is where the zones are defined. 
You can see there's an option here as well to select rectangles so you can actually fill in bigger areas rather than just using the brush to fill in one square at a time. And then if you go back into object detection as I showed you earlier, then this is where you can define the zones that you are actually interested in for motion detection. When we look at alerts and notifications, you'll also be able to see that you can use these zones to trigger alerts and notifications for specific zones. And they're the main settings of motion detection really. There are a couple of others that you can play with like just detecting in black and white or the algorithm it uses to actually detect if there's motion. But I found that the edge vector default one is completely fine. So there's three main ways to access Blue Iris. So that's accessing Blue Iris directly on the machine that you've got it installed on, or it's accessing it via the web UI or via the mobile apps. I've got Blue Iris showing on the tablet here, and this is actually just the web UI. It's not the mobile app. So for me, I find that sufficient. You can look through historic footage and you can click into cameras and see the live view. So that does for me. But if you want things like notifications and alerts, then you're probably going to need to look at the mobile app. Okay, so here is the Blue Iris web user interface called UI3, and I've just accessed it through Google Chrome. So let's go through the settings. In the middle, you can obviously see that it shows the camera here. There would be multiple cameras if I had multiple cameras set up and it would just show in a grid. And then on the left hand side, you've got PTZ control. So if it's a pan and tilt camera, you can actually change the angle from here. And then you've got some PTZ presets if your camera does that. And then looking further down, this is the profile. So you can actually change what profile is set at the moment from here. So that's quite handy. You can see here it's got group. So if you create multiple groups with different cameras, you can select the group here and then it will just show those cameras within the grid. So that's quite useful if you've got lots of cameras and you just want to see certain ones within your house. So say just the front garden cameras or just the ones at the back of the house. And then here, this is really handy as well, especially if you're, say, on a slow internet connection or your mobile phone or something like that, then you can change the streaming quality. So it's got lots of different settings. You can do variable bit rate and you can do constant bit rate as well. And it goes right down to a really low resolution all the way up to 1080p and then 4K. If I select the different resolutions to show you what it looks like, so there's on 4K. And then this is on the lowest resolution and you can clearly see that is very pixelated. The bottom left is useful as well, especially for me when I'm running my production instance because it's on a fairly low powered Intel NUC. So the CPU usage is often quite high. As you can see here on this machine, it's quite low and you can see the frames per second that you're getting. This is a Wi-Fi camera, so it's a bit less reliable than a wired camera. So the frame rates might drop a little. And then looking at the top, you can see that we're on live view at the moment, but if you click clips, then it will show you all the historic clips that have been taken with this camera. And you can also filter by different cameras. If you click here, then you can actually filter by lots of different things. You can filter by different folders where your footage is stored, by alerts, and you can even filter by different zones. So if you've got different detection zones set up, then you can filter by those zones specifically. You can also see there's a calendar here, so you can select a range of dates for the footage that you want to look at. And then these clips shown here will be the length that you set your recording for. So if you set it to record for an hour per clip, then each clip will be an hour. Whereas if you have set just motion events, then each clip will be a varied length. So the final tab is timeline. So you can see at the bottom that here it's got a timeline for the day, and then it will show events on here if you've got different motion events. I haven't got any on here at the moment. If we look on the top right, you can see there's a few quick buttons here. So this will take you straight to all clips. And then this one will take you to filtering by just alerts. And then this one allows you to do a snapshot, which I think is quite nice. So if you want to do a quick snapshot of what you're looking at at the moment, then you can just press that button. On the three dots, you've got a settings menu and you can change various things here. You can look at disk usage, system log, you can look at the users, but probably the one that's most useful is the UI settings itself. So if we click into here, you can see you can change various settings here. Something that I find useful here is changing the idle timeout so that the actual interface itself doesn't time out. It can be quite annoying that it keeps timing out and then you've got to click a button to go back into it. So you might want to increase this or even set it to zero so that it doesn't time out at all. You can also change some other settings here around bitrate and compression. So you might need to do this if you've got a really slow connection, but to be honest, I don't really touch these settings. 
If you scroll down on here, you can see there's a vast amount of settings. I've not even looked at them all myself. Upon scrolling through these UI settings, I've just actually noticed that there's MQTT control from within the UI, which is really interesting. I don't think that's available on the version I'm using in production at the moment, so I'm going to look into that more. I think that it means that you can actually control this web user interface on this machine remotely. So maybe say if you had a screen somewhere showing some cameras, so say in a shop, then you could get it to actually change between different views. So I'm definitely going to look into that. And that's it really. So that's the web interface that you can use to view and control your cameras. When it comes to alerts and notifications, the obvious choice is push notifications to your mobile phone. But as I mentioned earlier, I don't like to expose my instance to the internet, so that makes that a bit trickier. So what I do instead is I use MQTT Broker and do notifications through that. There's a lot of flexibility. You can do emails, you can do notifications via MQTT, via the mobile app, and lots more. You can even trigger actions on your computer. So have a look through all the options available and see what suits you best. All right, so now let's look at some of the alerting options that I mentioned. So as with most of the tabs, you can do all these settings per profile. So if you actually change a different profile, then you can have a different setting for that profile. But for this, we're just going to look at one profile. So firstly, you decide when it actually does an alert. So the typical thing would be when this camera is triggered, but also if you've got groups of cameras, so say you've got multiple cameras in a similar area, then you might want to trigger based on the group instead. I'm gonna leave it as this option. You can then also determine whether it alerts just for new triggers or new and re-triggers. And then here is where you can decide which motion zones you actually want to send an alert for. Because there might be some where you want to just record and then others where you actually want to send an alert. The timers area is where you can constrain how many alerts are sent so that you don't get bombarded. So it's up to you, depending on your use case, which ones of these you might want to use. So for me, the most interesting section is the alert section here. So on alert, so that basically means when motion has been triggered, what do you do? And then when motion has stopped being detected, what do you do there? So let's click this one first. Now, if we click the plus sign, we can see all the options available to us. So you can trigger a sound, a push notification, execute a program, send an MQTT command, which is what I do, send an email, which I showed you the email settings. So as long as you've set up your SMTP settings, then you can do that. You can also send an SMS, which I haven't looked at myself at all, or make a phone call. Some of these other settings are a bit more obscure and probably don't get used as much. FTP upload image might also be useful here if you haven't set up the FTP settings elsewhere. Once you've created your rules, then you can enable and disable the rules separately, or you can enable and disable the entire thing up here. If we go to the on reset section, then you can see it's exactly the same, and you define your rules there for when motion hasn't been detected anymore. So for me, what I do here is I send a different MQTT message for when motion has been detected for when it hasn't. So if we click in here, you can see either you can do a HTTP request, or you can do an MQTT request by selecting the topic and the payload you want to send. You can see that actually for each action, you can define the profile and the motion zones that you want the action to occur. So it really is quite flexible. There's also a test button here, which might be useful to make sure that your actions are working as expected. So when you trigger an alert, you're probably going to want to include some information about the camera itself. So if you look in the Blue Iris documentation, you can see different variables that you can use within your action. So here's a list here. Well, that's most of the settings that you need to know about to get you up and running with alerts and notifications. This video has already been quite long, but it's been by no means exhaustive. So if there's anything that you'd like to hear about in Blue Iris, then please leave a comment below and I'll consider doing a video on it. And please consider subscribing while you're there and liking the video if you enjoyed it. Well, that's it for today. So thanks until next time.